Chen Feng used to say that when we meditate, we're gaining practice and the skills we're going to need when we die. That's two of the big problems that will happen as death approaches will be distraction and pain. The same problems we deal with as we're meditating. You're sitting here trying to get the mind with the breath. And you first you find yourself fighting off distraction. And if you don't get the distractions out of the way in time, then the pain comes, especially if you sit for long periods of time. Or if you're not used to sitting in the meditation posture. And it's how you learn how to deal with these problems that will give you the skill that you need, the skills that you need when death approaches, either if it comes very quickly and unexpectedly or at the end of a long illness. We had two members of our extended community died yesterday, one after a long illness and the other very unexpectedly struck down crossing a street. When death happens suddenly, time slows down, so a lot of decisions are being made at that split second. A lot of things will be coming up in the mind, and you have to decide what to focus on and what not to focus on, just like you're trying to decide right now. Here you're told to stay with the breath. At that point, of course, the breath will be leaving. And one of the skills that's really useful to have as you meditate is learning how to gain a sense of awareness on its own. You're aware of the breath. In the beginning stages of the concentration, you're trying to become one with the breath. But then when you become one with the breath, there's kind of a natural separation out. It's like two different kinds of liquid, like oil and vinegar in the same bottle. The bottle sits still for a while, they begin to separate out naturally. You don't have to divide the vinegar from the honey. Go through with every molecule. Instead, the, the molecules separate out on their own. Well, it's the same with the mind. When you're still with the breath long enough, with a sense of being one with the breath, after all, there comes a sense of separating out. It's a good skill to have. You know, as the Buddha said, consciousness doesn't need a body in order to continue being conscious. It's an activity that feeds off of other things as well. It can feed off of your craving. It can feed off of your clinging. So that's what you have to watch out for when death comes. Where are your cravings and clingings going to take you? The Buddha points out there are two things you have to watch out for. One is being worried at death. In other words, there are things that you've left behind, either issues in your family or issues at work, unresolved things. At that point, he says, you've got to let go. There's nothing you can do about them. The time for doing things about them has passed. And if you can remember that, it'll help untangle a lot of entanglements so that otherwise would keep you tied down. Years back I was invited to chat at a house. When the grandmother died, it turned out that she had buried a fortune, not very large, but a sum of money, under one of the trees behind the house. And people meditating in the house picked up the fact that she was still hanging around that tree. What was peculiar about it was that they were able to get in touch with her through the meditation and ask her, what, you know, what would help you give up your attachment? First she had told them about the fortune, but then she was still hanging around the tree. She couldn't get let go of the tree. And she said, well, there's this Western monk who knows how to chant the Mahasamaya. I haven't come and chanted at the house. <laughs> So they tracked me down. That's an illustration of what happens when you hang on to something. You get reborn in a tree. And there are worse things to get reborn into, depending on what you get worried about, but unfinished business. So the Buddha says if you're giving counsel to anybody who's dying, or you're giving counsel to yourself, you just suddenly find yourself 
faced with death. First thing is, don't worry about anything you're leaving behind. The time has come to let it go, because the mind is going to move on now. And you've got to be very careful about what it's moving on to. The other thing you have to watch out for at the moment of death is fear. You know, fear of the unknown, of course. A fear of death, as the Buddha analyzed it, basically comes down to four things. One is fear of losing the body or leaving the body. This is one of the reasons why we do that contemplation of the body parts, to realize that there's not that much worth hanging on to here. If you go through the different parts, do you want to hang on to your liver? Do you want to hang on to your intestines? When you take the body apart in that way, you begin to see there's nothing here worth hanging on to, nothing worth being worried about. Of course, for a lot of us, we can't think of any way that we would be aware or conscious without being with the body. So one of the things we have to realize is that it's not necessary for awareness to continue. The awareness will continue without the body. If you can get into meditation to the point where you hit any of the formless attainments, you find that it's true. The consciousness, as you experience it from within, doesn't have to have any relationship to a body at all. And this is the important thing. Looking from the outside, people say, well, the fact that you're conscious means even though you're not aware of the body, your consciousness depends on the body. But when you die, you're not worried about people looking at you from the outside. You're worried about your consciousness as you experience it from within. And if you can get used to the idea of being conscious without a sense of the body, that helps give you some confidence that maybe it's true what the Buddha said, that you don't have to worry about hanging on to the body. As John Fung used to say, he would sometimes go around the what do you call it, the body shops at Wapmakut, this uh, major cremation monastery in Bangkok. And sometimes on a Saturday evening, not many people came to meditate with him. They'd come during the day. And so he'd take some time to go out and stretch his legs. And they'd have these pavilions where the funerals were being held. He came back one evening and he said, you know, the number of people who die and still hang around the bodies is awfully large. He didn't say anything more than that. But this is something you've got to watch out for. You don't want to be stuck on your body, because it's a miserable place to be, hanging around a dead body. You have to realize that this is not yours anymore. This is no place for you. Nothing, is he nothing here is, is going to help you. It's time to move on. So it's good to learn how to contemplate the body, both through contemplation of the body parts, contemplation of the body into elements. or gaining a sense of concentration where you don't have to depend on the body. The body's not impinging on your awareness. This gives you some confidence that you don't want to hang around here, and you don't have to hang around here. The second reason we fear death is because of our fear of losing our human sensual pleasures. And here the Buddha says, remind yourself there are other levels of being where the pleasures are a lot better. And his contemplation of sensuality as we experience it on the human level, all the various analogies he gives for how sensuality is really unsatisfying and dangerous, those are good to keep in mind. The chain of bones that the dog is gnawing on, a little lump of flesh that a hawk is carried off and other hawks are going to go after it because it, it has the flesh and they want it. A drop of honey on a knife edge. Borrowed goods. It's good to keep the drawbacks of sensuality in mind, because they are sensual pleasures are dangerous. Sensual desires are going to drive you to go into dangerous places. As he gave instructions to Mahanama, the Buddha said, okay, if someone is dying, 
remind them there are better pleasures than the human realm. Have them think about the deva pleasures. You can take them up to various levels, and each level is replete with sensual pleasures a lot more refined than on the lower levels. So at the very least, you don't want to be stuck on the pleasures you're going to leave behind. Realize there's a lot, there's higher levels of happiness than that, and going beyond the sensual pleasures, there's the pleasure of kind of concentration. If you've had some experience with concentration, that's where you want to go. If you can't manage anything higher than that, try to get in a sense of just being still with a sense of ease. That doesn't have to depend on sensual pleasures. That can help wean you off that fear that you're going to be missing out on nice tastes and nice sights and sounds and smells, whatever. The third reason for fear is thinking back on your life and you realize you've done some cruel things, some harmful things, and you're afraid that there's going to be punishment for that. As the Buddha pointed out, there is no need to be punished. He says there are lots of cases where people do unskillful things in this lifetime, and then they have good rebirth in the, in the next. And It's because their minds have been trained in the meantime, and they have other good karma. They can counteract that. This is one of the reasons why they have people think about the good things they've done, not the good times they've had, the good things they've done, in terms of being generous and virtuous as death approaches. Because that gives you the confidence that if you suddenly see a vision of a hell or something, you don't have to go there. And the final reason for fear of death is that you haven't seen the true Dharma. You don't know for yourself directly that there is a deathless dimension to the mind. This is the most important of the four, because people can tell you about this is how you approach death, this is how you deal with your fears about losing the body, losing sensual pleasures, fears about unskillful things you've done in the past. You don't have to worry about those things. You can hear about it and you can have conviction in it, but there's part of the mind that's not 100% there. And that can change very quickly, that little bit of percentage that's not fully on board with this. If you've seen the deathless, though, you know that there is that deathless dimension. You also know that this lifetime was not the only lifetime you've had. Because when you see the deathless, you're stepping out of time for, for a while. And in stepping out of time, you see a time that you've been aware and conscious, and your consciousness has been feeding and going from one place to another. It's a lot longer than just this particular lifetime. When you see that, that's the end of your real fear of death. So that's what we want to work on as we meditate, is to get the mind to that point where it can know for itself and confirm for itself that there is a deathless and that death is not the end. And that the skills you've developed as you've been meditating really will make a difference. Up until that point, you have to take it on faith. It's a matter of conviction. The Johns keep saying, hey, believe this, believe this. They can't prove it for you, but they've proved it for themselves. So try to get to the point in your meditation where you can prove it for yourself, too. It'll make a huge difference as death approaches. You can approach it with a lot more confidence. So we talk about using the skills and meditation in daily life. Well, they're for all aspects of life, even the big events in life, including aging, illness, and death. These skills really can look after the well-being of the mind, regardless of what happens to the body.